Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, flip there in your phone. Um, and while you're doing that, let me say this. Next week is one of those days that you cannot miss. Like, I don't care if you get up late, miss taking a shower, your dog dies, you got to be here kind of Sunday, okay? I'm sorry about Fluffy, but you got to be here. I mean, it, it is imperative because it's Vision Sunday. Vision Sunday is the day that we, we kind of take some time to look at where we're going as a church. Now, here's what I want to be honest with you. We took a whole month to get you straightened out. I mean, we took the whole month of January to get you praying, and, and we've been talking about reading the Bible. So we, we've taken a whole month to get you straightened out, but it was to, to, to this point because you are us and us has somewhere to go, and we got something to do for the kingdom. And so I, I want you to be here next Sunday. If you call Twin Rivers home, you've got to be here. It's going to be an incredible day. Uh, that you just, You're going to be sad if you miss it. I mean, like sadder than if you have to bury your dog, sadder than if you miss it. So please be here next Sunday for Vision Sunday, this one special day where we're going to be talking about so much of what, where God's taken us. Um, I'm so excited to jump back into the One Resolution series. This is the final part of this series where we basically said, hey, there's only one resolution you need this year. Just make a commitment to be in God's word daily. If you'll do that, if you'll make that one resolution, your whole life will turn out the way that you, God designed it to and the way that you really desire for it to. And so um, today is going to be so practical, just super practical and helpful. We've, we've hopefully helped encourage you and empower you, but today I want to equip you and I just want to help you really understand the Bible and how you can, can make it a part of your everyday life. You know, our house is experiencing what I would call the, uh, the full-on preschool stage. You know, the, this, this preschool stage is interesting because there's a transition from dependence to independence, you know, where it's potty training, it's, 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 it's all these different things that we're trying to teach our kids to now be able to do independently, and probably none is more entertaining than the transition from being dependent to independent when it comes to feeding yourself. You know, when, when it really comes down to it, that is one that takes a lot of time and a lot of paper towels uh, to, to get someone to where they can feed themselves. And Ellie, our, our rambunctious two-year-old, she now believes that she can do that so much that she will now get out of the bed in the mornings and instead of coming in and kind of seeing old mom and dad, she just goes straight to the kitchen and, and starts making breakfast all her own. Now, um, a couple mornings ago, um, Ellie did that. She went straight down before we saw her, before anybody else was down there, and her, her, her dish of choice for breakfast this morning was ice cream cones. She decided that she would make ice cream cones. And so I came downstairs, being the first one to see Ellie's you know, doings, and, and I see that, that Ellie is, is well, I, I had kind of the same experience that every parent, I think, has had. Like, as I looked at ice cream cones on the kitchen floor, and the living room floor, and the dining room floor, and on the counter, and on the couch, and on the rugs. You, you, you just, every parent has paused and asked themselves what I did in that moment, which was, what is the definition of child abuse? <laughs> like, like, what is that true definition? Um, with the follow-up question of, now, how long do I have to keep her? Like, what, what, is, is, is just, what is it? You know, because here's what it comes down to. Part of maturing physically and spiritually is learning to feed yourself. You know, part, that's just part of life is you've got to learn to feed yourself physically and spiritually. You know, there, there are millions of Christians around the world who have grown older but haven't grown up. I mean, you know some of them. They're, they're the people who've grown older, but they haven't grown up. And, and it's because spiritual growth is not automatic. You know, it's something that you have to take a decision and be very intentional about. And if you don't, you may continue to grow older, but it doesn't mean that you're growing up. And, and, and although Sunday, being here on a Sunday, is extremely important and vital to your spiritual health, you can't live on Sunday alone. As, as a matter of fact, if my uh, messages, whether good or bad, if they're the best you've ever heard, it's still not good enough for you to live on solely. You, you really have, but, but what's kind of happened in churches today, not this church, of course, like other churches, um, um, one of the problems we've had is that we've kind of got this feed me attitude. You know, this is this feed me attitude that says, you know, I'm going to come to church and they better smile at me. And, 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 you know, they better feed me something pretty good out of God's word. 
And it better be a great message, that I've, and, and it better talk about something that I've never heard before, and it, and it kind of needs to be, that you better have some memorable illustrations, and it better be funny, and, and it, it better be, you know, in great, but, it, but all important, it better be on time. It better, better not be too long. You know, and kind of that feed me attitude. I mean, all we're missing is a high chair at that point, right? I mean, it's just like we kind of have some people who, who look at, at things that way. And, you know, the Apostle Paul, who wasn't one to mince words, he, he encountered a little of this in one of the churches he pastored. And it, it's in 1 Corinthians 3. Here, here's what he says. Dear brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would spiritual people. You got to love Paul. He's just like, hey, I, I couldn't even talk to you the way I wanted to. He said, I had to talk to you as though you belonged to this world or as though you were infants in Christ. I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food, because you weren't ready for anything stronger. You know, Paul's pretty straight here, but here's what he's painting a picture of is of a nursing infant. And, and the thing, you know, infants are great. I mean, we, we've got plenty of them, you know. But uh, here's the thing about nursing infants is, is that, you know, first... They get all their food by being dependent on someone else. They're fed because they're dependent on someone else. And not only that, infants get all of their food secondhand. You know, it's, it's, it's the mother who eats and then passes on the nutrients to the child. And that's a picture of kind of what Sundays are for, for a lot of people. Is, is I'm the one taking it in and then I'm the one passing it on. And they're dependent when it comes to feeding themselves, uh, on, on, on kind of the pastor, on me. And, 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 you know, and, and here's what I also know about, about kind of the infants is they realize pretty quickly that though milk is good for a season, it's not fulfilling for a lifetime. Right? I mean, like Sydney, who, who was fine with milk for months, all of a sudden, she, she, like when we're eating, she's starting to watch my fork. Like I could move it this way and her eyes move that way and I can move it this way. Because she, she realizes milk alone is not, not very fulfilling. Here's what I know to the Sunday-only feeders. You can't be happy and fulfilled, satisfied, with just a a once-a-week meal. You you really can't have satisfaction from that. I mean, you you know, you, you really can't believe that Jesus came all the way to the earth, redeemed your soul through dying on the cross, just so you could listen to me for 45 minutes a week. I mean, there has to be something more that, that God's designed out of this relationship that he wants with you. And, and so this is kind of what, what I want you to see is that all those Sundays are great. Man, you should try Monday through Saturday in God's word. Yeah, I mean, that's when it's really satisfying. I mean, he, hearing God through me, that, that's good. We all need that. But man, wait till you hear from God through your own life. And you, you can hear him directly about you. I mean, you're talking about satisfaction. That is really satisfaction. So here's today's goal, to get you off the bottle and onto the Bible. That, that's what today's goal is. We're going to get you off the bottle and onto the Bible. But what I realize is, is that, that we got to understand it. And, and I want to be honest with you. I grew up in church. I knew about church. I knew how to do church. And I knew very little about the Bible. Very little about the Bible. And here's the thing. I thought everybody else knew about it, and I was the only one. So I just acted like I knew about it. But turns out, while I was acting like I knew about it, because I thought they knew about it, they didn't know about it either. And none of us knew about it. And and what you find is, is that people become very proficient at church, but not necessarily at understanding the Bible. And so it wasn't until years later, after my faith had been established, that I needed to understand the Bible. And that's what I want to help you with today is because I, I didn't even know some of the big picture basics. So I want to help you with that today. And we're going to go into kind of just a little, for some of you, it may be, you know, honestly, it may just be kind of elementary. And for others, I think a lot of us, to be honest with you, it could be something you, you, did, you just didn't know that you need to understand. So here's what I want to start with. The Bible, the word Bible, means book. Okay, that, that, it means book. It, it's nothing incredible about the word Bible. As a matter of fact, the, the word Bible doesn't set anything aside. It's the word that comes before Bible, holy Bible. That's the reason that this book is so special is because it's a holy Bible. And, and, and the reason we know it's holy is because of 2 Timothy 3, uh, 16. It says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful. For teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So that the people of God 
may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Paul uses kind of an unusual word here. He says, God breathed. This is the only time it appears in Scripture. And it's this Greek word that implies that something has been breathed out. It is, has come from inside of God and been breathed out. And, and, and you know where that happens in your life? When you speak, you breathe out. And so what that Paul is saying is, is that, that Scripture is when God spoke out out into 40 different writers over 1,500 years on three different continents is when he spoke out over them and impressed his mind onto them so that they could put his thoughts on paper without error. He spoke out over it. But you know what else that means? It means when you read the Bible, God is speaking out over your life. When you read the Bible, it's not some dead thing. It's not some historical document. It's speaking out. The Spirit of God is speaking out over your life. Paul also says that it is useful. Now, that's a word that a lot of people wouldn't use to describe the Bible. Historical, impressive, you know, um, uh, doctrinal, but not useful. But Paul says, hey, the, the real goal of the Bible is it's useful. God never intended it to be theory or philosophy. He intended it for you to use in your family, in your marriage, in your business, and in your leadership, and in your purpose. It's useful. But what you have to understand is it's not useful until you understand it. So I, to just start out with, I want to give you the Bible's basic function for us in a it's just two reasons, because you, you can look at the Bible for a lot of different things. Maybe you use it to make points, or maybe you use it to, to decide not to do certain things, but here's the real big picture of what the Bible's for. This is what God's intent was. First of all, it's to know God. To know God. God said the best way for, for my people to get to know me is for me to, to transcribe my thoughts, my, what I like, what I dislike, who I am, where I go, where I don't go, what I stay away from, all those things onto the Bible. And so he, he did that. And so if you want to know who God is, you have to read what God said. And it's just to get to know him. But the second part is very important. The second reason that, that scripture is the basic function is to kind of see man and he, what it looks like without God. To see man and his need for God. Because you know what the Bible's filled with? Examples of people who chose to ignore God and who found destruction. The Bible's filled with all kinds of examples. Now, they have a lot of nuanced details, but when you really look at it, it comes down to God is saying, here's who I am, and we see other people's responses to that. And when they choose God, they live under blessing and in a relationship that's fulfilling. And when they don't choose that, we get to see how much we really need God. I mean, whole communities and nations that turn from God, and we get to see their destruction. We don't have to figure it out for ourselves. We get to see what it looks like when we don't have God in our life, when we look at Scripture. Now, there are 66 books in this one book. There's 66 of them, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. And, and now, verses and chapters were added much later. That They were added for our convenience. They were not a part of the original manuscripts that, that was Scripture. They're just they're to help you in that way, shape, and form. Um, now, here's the thing you got to know. I didn't know this. The 66 books do not read cover to cover. Like, it doesn't read like a novel. Like, you would just sit down and start in the beginning and end up in the end and kind of figure it out. It can be very confusing if you do that. The, the Bible was grouped, these 66 books were grouped by type, by types of, of books, not, not necessarily by, by, you know, chronologically. So here's what I want to take you. I want to take you through the Bible. And I want to look at the books and the types and what they're for to give you a little bit of understanding because if you're anything like me, maybe you've read at times and you're like, what are we talking about here? I thought we were in a kingdom and now all of a sudden we're in a vision. And it's just like, it's very difficult. So, so here are the, here's an overview of the Old Testament. First, the first category or type of books is law, the law. These are the first five books of the Bible, Genesis through Deuteronomy. And this is the story of creation. It's Noah and the ark. It's God establishing a relationship with a man named Abraham to create a whole people for himself. It's also those people falling into to bondage in Egypt and Moses having to go rec rescue them on God's behalf because he never designed them to be in bondage. And, and so th this is an overview. It's the, very, the, the first five books. It's about the law. The reason it's called the law is because it's God God's way of showing us what a relationship without grace had to look like. He, he's saying, hey, if you wanted to get to me and in a relationship with me without grace, without the work of Jesus, this is what it would look like to live then and there. 
Now, here's the second is historical. Now, these are a fun read, to be honest with you. They're, they're great. There's just stories and battles. And, like, if you're a guy, this is your, your section. Like, you love all the head chopping off and the, and the impaling. I mean, this is your section right here. There are 12 books from Joshua to Esther. Now, these books are chronological in the fact that they take us from after Moses all the way to the end of the Old Testament. They take us from the people going into the promised land and setting up, but it also shows that when they desired a king more than they desired God. And what the result of that was is towards the end, they're in captivity. And, and it shows all that. And, and the Old Testament historically ends with the book of Esther. The book of Esther is actually the end of the Old Testament from a historical standpoint. Now, the next, the next two categories can be the difficult ones. The, the next one is poetical, and these are the, the five books, Job through Song of Solomon. And he, here's what's going on. You ever read, you're reading the story, and then all of a sudden it's like, out of nowhere, this poem comes, or this, 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 like, this guy's whining about something, or this guy's celebrating something. It's like all this emotion, you don't really grasp the context. That's because these books are the commentary to what's happening in the historical books. So, so when David is fighting Goliath, he's actually pinning in his journal and memoirs about what that feels like, and those books from Psalms fit into the historical books. So one of the best experiences you could have in Scripture is to get a chronological Bible because it divides up the poetical section and puts it in the historical section, meaning you'll read about David in a battle, and then you'll read what David's thoughts are. We're on that battle. But if you're just reading it straight, it can be a little difficult to understand. So th these are just the, their stories and, and hymns and poems and songs that people are writing as they're living life. And, now, and then the last one is prophetical. And this is one of the things that makes the Bible stand apart. We've talked about this. There's a lot of books out there. But there are no books like the Bible that have consistently predicted the future. They've predicted what's happened. They predict what's happening and what will happen. And there are 17 of these in the Old Testament, and, and there are five major. Now, they're not major because they're, they're more important. They're major because they're larger. They're just larger books, Daniel and the lion's den, Ezekiel. But then there are 12 minor prophets as well. And this is what God is saying during the historical period. So again, it's taking what is being said here and placing it in the historical period so people can understand. God was predicting their dis when they wanted a king... More than they wanted God, a prophet stood up and started to say, well, this is what that'll look like, and you'll end up in captivity. Constantly trying to help them through prophecy make their way back to God. Now, after the Old Testament, in your Bible, between Old Testament and New Testament, there is a 400-year gap, 400 years, of what they call the divine silence. 400 years, that is, um, basically, God doesn't speak to a prophet, a scribe, anybody. It's during this time that Israel returns from captivity to start building up Jerusalem and living again. The story of Nehemiah is kind of during this time. But it's also during this time that they're conquered again by the Greeks and Alexander the Great, and then actually to the Romans who evolved from, from the Greeks. And it's at the Romans' time period that the central figure of all of Scripture, what it's all about, enters the picture, and that's Jesus Jesus enters at this, he's the center of the book. He's the center. He's the whole point in the whole book. It's Jesus. And, and we, we get to see Jesus enter and we get to see his life in what's called the Gospels. The Gospels are, are the Gospel just means good news. And that's because Jesus is the good news. We've, we've, we've went our own way. We've tried to do it our own way. And we, it's, been up, it's ended up terrible. Today we get Jesus. And, and that's the Gospel. It's the good news. Now it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, if you've ever read the Gospels, you may say, well, I've already read that story. Why am I reading this again? It's like the same story. I keep reading it. It's because they are different accounts of the same story. They're, they're, it's basically like if you and I saw a car accident, another person, and they came and took our, our testimony of that car accident, we would all have some nuances that are different. So that's what the Gospels are. It's the same story, just different accounts. But then the Gospels end, and we go back into a historical period called Acts. Acts is after Jesus. It's once Jesus has died, resurrected, went back to heaven. It's, it's the establishment of his church. Here's something you may not know. You're living in the book of Acts. It doesn't stop. The book of Acts doesn't have a period that it ends in. The church age starts, and, and, and the church is established, and you're a part of that today. Even setting here, you're a part of the book of Acts. Now, during the book of Acts, which is historical, and it's great, great stories, great. It's just beautiful to see how the church, we try to look like our church. We want to look like the book of Acts. The same things we see in the book of Acts is what we want to see here. 
Now, but then we go into the epistles, and there are 20 of them, and these are the people who are living in Acts. This is their writings and teachings, and they're good for doctrine and instruction and how to live. And that's why we spend so much time in the epistles is they teach us how to live as a church established in the book of Acts. Then finally, there's one book that stands all by itself, and that's the book of Revelation. It is his own category because it is not a book that talks about what's happening in the moment. It's not historical. It's, not, it's completely prophetic. It shows, it, it gives prophecy to what has happened, what is currently happening, and what will happen in the future. It shows us Jesus returning for us and establishing his church again. And, and when we're all going to be with him, it shows the end of the age and how we transition into eternity. It is a completely prophetic book that is, is meant to encourage us. Now, here's one of the things I need to tell you about this. The Old Testament is to learn by. The New Testament is to live by. Okay? If you try to live by the Old Testament, you're going to have to buy a lot of animals because you've got a lot of sacrifice coming your way. But if, but, but if you, you can learn from it, you just got to live by the New Testament. So that's why we, we, we use the Old Testament as a great example, and the New Testament is how we can live today in, in, in that way that it's laid out for us. Now, here, here's what I want to do. I want to transition from the, this whole um, idea of, of understanding the Bible, of, of just the basics, because we could spend all day on that. And I want to transition into something that is universal to every person in this room, and that is how to hear God's voice through God's Word. Because, I mean, what good does it do us if we, I mean, let, let me put it this way. It's fine to, to know the Bible, but I want to make sure you know the author, I mean, it's one thing to know the Bible, but it's a whole other thing to know the author. See, Bible, when you're reading the Bible, is not a task to be completed. It's a relationship to be grown. And you can understand all the historical content. There are people who study the Bible their whole lives and have no relationship with the God who wrote it. And so the, I, I don't want you to be that. And so I just want to spend the rest of our time practically helping you how to understand God, and, and hear God's voice through God's word. That's what I really want to, to give to you. Now, before we jump into that, let me say the first step, really, before I give you the real point, let me tell you this. If you want to understand and hear God's voice through God's word, you got to understand this. you got to get the spiritual picture of what you think the Bible should be doing in your life out of your head. Some of us think when, when we open the Bible, there should be like a like these lights that are taking, you know, that come out of nowhere and like immediately it's like, I say to the, we got to get that out of your head. Because if you're like me, I, I, I was like that my whole life. And, and you know, what I would do is I would hear people say, God said to me in his word. And I just pictured like their face glowing and like Jesus walking in the room and like delivering the memo himself. And, and then here's what would happen. I would take that expectation into my time with the Bible. And instead of that, I'd fall asleep. You know, it's like, this person gets a shining face in Jesus, I'm asleep, like, you know, drooling all over the Old Testament. So, so you got to get that, that picture out of your mind, because if you're not careful, you end up building that, and, and, and the Bible, that experience is not going to be how you hear God most of the time, if ever. There's a completely different experience that's taking place that God wants to cultivate with you, so you got to get that out of your head. And here's why. Because God is not looking for perfection, he's looking for pursuit, you see, if, if what I'm about to share with you, you think this is the only way to do it and it has to be done this way and it turns into a checklist for you, you're looking for perfection. And, and, and this is one way, it's helpful, but this is not the only way to seek God. But if you think it is, you'll, you'll go after perfection and you'll stop pursuing God. God doesn't care about perfection, even if we could obtain it. He cares about, are you, will you just keep showing up? Will you just keep chasing after him? Will you keep reading when you don't understand and when you do understand? Will you just keep pursuing him? That, that, that's what God cares about. Not, not if you do it exactly the right way and exactly the time I talk about. So let's jump into it. I'm going to give you six things for how to, how to hear God's voice through God's word. Here's number one. Make an appointment with God's word. Make an appointment. If I was going to, to visit with you, I would make an appointment. I'd put it on my calendar and I'd keep it. And, and we do this for oil changes and haircuts and lunches. How much more important is it that we do it daily with the God who put the whole universe together? It's an appointment that's worth keeping. I mean, it's, it's very, very important. And, and it's important for us because 
if we don't, we end up doing it by feeling. And if we do it by feeling, guess what? You typically don't find yourself doing it. So you got to make an appointment. Just decide this is God's time. Pastor Joe, what time should I give God? Give God when you're at your best. Give God when you're at your best. It doesn't matter. Some people, you know, I, I kind of grew up in this idea that God only spoke, you know, like between 3 and 5 a.m. Like, you know, it's everybody you ever hear say God spoke. It was like, it, apparently those are God's office hours. It has to be 3 to 5 a.m. Turns out God's open more than that. And, and so what we have to realize is that it's not so much about a time of day, although the morning is generally your best because you're most alert and ready to receive. It's not what it's about. It's about giving God your best. Now, here's what God loves about the mornings. He loves being first. God loves being first. And, and he want, here's what he's saying. I want to I speak over your day before you let anybody else. Like before other people in the office get to say what today's about, I want to say what today's about. God loves being first in, in that way. Um, and I know that for, as soon as we talk about this, some of you say, but Pastor Joe, I really struggle with consistency. Like I'm just not a person. I, I struggle to stay with it. Well, let me help you. Um, imagine you're going on vacation and, and you've got to fly to this destination, and you're looking forward to it, and it's exciting. But turns out you're going to have to alter your schedule and get up earlier to get to the airport. And not only are you going to have to get there earlier, and it's messing with your schedule, it's time to go, and you've got some emails that really do need to be, be dealt with. You've got a to-do list that hasn't been finished yet. You going to miss that appointment? No way. No way, I'm keeping the appointment, it's vacation. Vacation renews my soul, vacation is life-giving. I ain't missing vacation. The emails can wait, the to-do list can wait. I'm not missing vacation. Look at, this, look, look at your time with God the exact same way. Because when you spend time with him, it's life-giving and reviving to your soul in the exact same way. You gotta make an appointment, keep an appointment. Here's number two, quiet your mind. This is a popular verse of scripture that I want to give to you, but I want you to see it a different way. Psalm 46.10 says, be still and know that I am God. But I want you to look at it this way. I have to be still before I can know God. Be still and know that I'm God, but you got to be still before you can know God. Our minds are racing constantly. And if you start out your time with God, going straight to the Bible or straight to prayer, your mind will quickly go to that email and what she said and what's for dinner. Or at least that's where my mind goes on that last one there. So you got, you got to just quiet your mind. You have to close your eyes. you got to focus on God. You have to prepare to have this meeting with God, to, to have this time. And, and Pastor Robert Morris, who, who pastors a great church in Dallas, Texas, helped me understand this to a degree no one ever else has. I want to give you a passage of Scripture in Psalm 100, verse 4. Here's what it says. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. How do you enter his gates? With praise and thanksgiving. You need to worship until you sense God's presence. Because when you worship, it takes all the things that are in this world and makes them much smaller and takes God himself and makes him bigger. It clears your mind, it clears your soul, it helps you to focus on what God wants to say to you. So you just worship until you sense God's presence and then you're ready to move on to the next thing. Now you may be asking, what do you mean worship? What, 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 what do you want me to sing? Here's what you need to sing. Whatever God put in your heart. If you're like me, most days there's a song, whether old or recent, off from the radio or worship service, that's in your heart. Guess who put it there? God did. He put it there because he wants you to sing it to him. And, and you may say, well, I'm not a singer. Well, neither am I. And so some days when no one's around, I sing it to God. But on other days, I just I rehearse it in my mind. And his presence moves in all the same. He's not there for your, your voice He's there because he's put a melody in your heart, and it takes worship to enter his presence. Now, here's the third one. The third one is get into God's word. You've cleared your mind. You've made this appointment. It's time to get into God's word. It's better to start with the Bible than prayer. Here's why. Is, to be honest with you, it's more important that you hear from God than he hears from you. God knows everything about you. You're not going to tell him something he don't know, but you don't know as much as you need to know about God. So start with the Bible because if we're not careful, we can end up coming to these times with God and just spilling everything, which you should do, but spilling everything to him and saying, okay, God, go fix that and leave. And he's like, I, I was just going to, and we're gone. 
And, and so it's very important that you, you just look at it and say, God, I want to hear from you first. And chances are whatever you were going to pray about, he's going to talk about before you pray about it. Okay? So, so here's what you need to do is, is you just need to, to clear it out. And then, God, you're first, and I'm going to concentrate on your word first thing. And, and here's what I want you to know, that a reading plan is important. And here's why. Because if we don't have a reading plan that takes us through the breadth of Scripture, that lets you see a lot of the Bible, you're going to end up going for the self-help reading plan, which is where you bounce around trying to find a verse for whatever you want God to do in your life. You're going to end up, well, no, nah, nah, that's not exactly what I'm looking for. Nah, 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 nah. And we start shopping the Bible. You need something that takes you through all the Scripture, that, that lets God bring his, his agenda to you versus you trying to find something in his word to support your agenda. And, 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 you know, there's a lot of people who, who uh, kind of employ this whole kind of point and claim it, you know, this name it, claim it idea of I'm just going to open my Bible and stick my finger down. And, you know, it reminds me of a story that I heard. There was a, a guy who went to attend a business seminar, and he went to attend this seminar, and the speaker was a very successful businessman who was also a Christian. And he told the audience that he had consulted God's Word often for business decisions. He said, one day I looked, and there was the word cattle. And so I invested in cattle, and it was a great return. The next, he said, not that long after, I saw the word oil. And so I invested in oil and doubled my returns on that. The man in the audience thought, well, that sounds pretty good. So he went home, picked up his Bible, and said, God, um, what is, where, where's my business going? What do, you, what, what do you see coming up for my business? He put his finger down, looked down, and it read chapter 11. That's bankruptcy, folks. <laughs> All right, I ain't bringing y'all no more jokes. No more jokes for y'all then. Here's what I need you to do. You need to read for quality, not quantity. Quality, not quantity. You know, it's great that you've got a goal to read the Bible through this year. That's terrific. But that's not the point. The point is, is that you read and then something hits you and changes you. And so this is, your, this is what you need to do. You can have a Bible reading plan. Read until you hit something. Read until there's just something that sticks out to you. That may be a scripture. It may be a chapter. It might be a book. But the point is you're going to read till God, you speak to me. Now, that doesn't mean you start weeping over the pages and all of a sudden. That may happen once in a while. But what it might mean is just this word sticks out. This, this, I just keep thinking about what was Abraham thinking in that moment or, or this one word or this one phrase and you, you just go back to it. You just, that's what's sticking out to you and you just stay on it. And if we're not careful, you know, we'll just run past it to get it done and check the list. This is about what sticks out to you. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me about what I'm reading here? Don't rush. The goal is not to get through Scripture. It's to get Scripture through us. Don't rush. This is not a box to be checked. You, 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 you just make sure, it's, you don't get through it, you get it through you, okay? Now, here, here's the next one. Whatever you got, whatever that one that stuck with you, stay, stay on what sticks out. Stay on it for a minute. God wants to say something to you. Throughout Scripture, we're told to meditate. Now, that word doesn't mean you need to buy a mat, and, and you don't need to say, well, I can't get my legs like that. This term meditate just means to think and ponder and consider what God is saying. And, and the truth is, is we're so fast-paced that we don't think about much. We're just rapid fire. But God says, I want you to sit and think about this. Because this is where information turns to revelation. It's where you take and you're reading a story about somebody from 2,600 years ago, and all of a sudden it makes all the sense in the world for your life today. And that, that's what I want you to do is take the time to really just consider it and the Holy Spirit's applying it to your life in those moments. So here's some questions that I ask myself that you should ask yourself when you find that one that sticks out to you. Here, here's some questions. Is there a command to obey? What's going on right now? Is there a command to obey in this scripture? Is there a promise to claim? God says that he's no respecter of persons. And so if he'll do it for Abraham, he's going to do it for me. I'm going to claim this promise. Is there sin to avoid? Very important, especially when reading the Old Testament. Here's why. Because if we're not careful, we're great lawyers. Like, like we'll read the Old Testament and we'll say, well, God, I mean, this doesn't apply to me because this guy chops somebody's head off. I ain't chopped nobody's head off this week, so, you know, then, then this must not be for me. Take a step deeper and say, why did that guy chop somebody's head off? Was it pride, arrogance, greed? Start to look deeper and you consider those things. What, 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 God, what are you showing me that doesn't need to be in my life through this story that doesn't look like my life? 
And is there a lesson to learn? What, what is it, God, that you're trying to teach me in this moment? Now, I know for a lot of you, just Pastor, my mind races. I cannot just, I, I can't just sit and think. And just, I'm, I'm all over the place. You're great at meditation. You just don't know it. See, see, remember the last time you were mad at somebody because they said something to you? And the rest of the day, you had that conversation over and over. And if they ever say that to me again, here's what I'm going to say. And if they respond that way, I'll say it this way. And, and you, I mean, you, you took that one thing and you lived the whole day on it. So you're great at meditation. And, and for some of you, it's about worry. You know, like you'll worry one issue to death. It'll take up weeks of your thought on this one issue. So see, you're great at meditation. You just need to figure out how to make it about God's word and not all these other things that God needs to be taken care of in your life. Now, here's number five. Record what God has given you. So you've got to write it down because God's saying stuff to you. He's saying things to you. He's giving you actions to take. And, and let me tell you, this isn't for publication. It's not to impress someone. This is between you and God. So it's, you don't have to worry about your grammar and all that. You're just, you're just taking and, and saying, this, God, I'm just putting this down, and here's why. Your journal is a spiritual DVR, okay? It means that you're recording all the great things God's doing in your life. You're recording the best things God's saying in your life. It's a spiritual DVR for you. It's just something you can go back to and watch the best replays of what God's been doing. And you, you need to really understand this because it was a game changer for me. I've read the Bible for years. When I started doing this, changed the whole ball game. And I just use a real simple system. I take one scripture from my reading, give a one prayer or observation, whichever one is most apparent to me, on one page. That's all I do. It's nothing profound. It's nothing amazing. One scripture, one observation or prayer, and, and, and then one uh, just on one page. That's all it is for me. And here's what I found is that I will pour myself out on this sheet of paper. And I'll write it, and, I'll just, and, and I'm not thinking. I'm just whatever. It doesn't make sense at the moment. And I'll, I'll go back and read it, and I'll be like, wow, where did this come from? I mean, this makes sense. I mean, when I was writing it, it just it didn't even feel like, but it just, it makes sense. Here's what's happening. Remember, I told you last week that reading the Bible is a spiritual experience. When you go back and read what you've written, your mind gets to see what your spirit already conceives. When, when you, you go back and read, your mind gets to see what God's been revealing to your spirit. And it doesn't make sense in that moment, but all of a sudden it just lays out perfectly. That's why you want to have a, a, an opportunity, a journal to record it. Now, here, here's the last one. Obey what God tells you to do. John 13, 17, these are Jesus' words. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. Let, let me just ask you this way. What is the point of going back day after day and hearing from God if we don't do anything of what he says? I mean, what's the point? If you can do all the reading, praying, and journaling you want, and it's all in vain until you start doing and, and, and so we have to realize that this is also the hardest step because this is the one the enemy fights you on. So what, what do you mean, Pastor Joe? Well, well, see, the enemy is fine with you going to the Bible, studying the Bible, reading the Bible. He just doesn't want you living the Bible. He, he's got no, I mean, there's lots of people that can tell you backwards and forwards and Greek and Hebrew and all these things, but you show me somebody who starts to apply and live what God's showing them in the Bible, and you'll find somebody that the enemy's active in their life because that's when uh, the, the, the real chips are on the table for him. And so the best two things that you can do to just be a doer of the word, this is just practical. First, write an action step every time you read the Bible. Every time, just simply ask, Holy Spirit, what do I need to do with this? It could be that you need to hold your tongue. It could be you need to invest in something, get away from someone. It could be that you need to go to someone. I mean, it could be all kinds. Of, just ask him, well, Holy Spirit, what is it I need to do with this? But here, here's the one that is really a game changer. Join a life group. Here's why. When you get around other people who are reading the Bible, trying to live the Bible, ex uh, help you understand the Bible, it's a game changer to your life. That's why we made such a big deal last week is you got to get in a life group because when you get around those people, it's not condemning and, oh, let's make sure they've done what they're supposed to. No, it helps you understand it and encourage it because you're all trying to live the Bible together. There, there's just something that's synergistic about your, your life group that really brings it to, to, to full front that you can start living God's Word. Now, let, let me say this, it doesn't matter anything I just told you if you don't get this point right here. The real key to, to, to understanding the Bible, but to really hear God's voice, 
is for you to know that this very saying right here, the Bible is meant to feed me today. The Bible's meant to feed me today. It's not meant to feed us. It feeds us. It's not meant to just feed Pastor Joe. It's, it's meant to feed me today. The Bible's meant, look at what Jesus says in Matthew 4.4. 4. I want you to see this. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. If Jesus in this moment is on a 40-day fast. He's given up, he's made a vow to God for 40 days. I will not eat because I, I want to show you that I don't, I don't have to have all this other stuff. I want you. And the devil comes to him. It's, it's who he's responding to is the devil comes to him and says, you need natural bread to be satisfied. You need natural bread to, to be strong. You need natural things to end up being uh, uh, equipped. And he says, no, no, no. He says, we don't live by the natural. We live, we're sustained. My strength comes from the supernatural word of God in my life every day. Now, now, let, let me ask you this. Why would Jesus draw a, a, a line between bread and, his, and, and God's word? Because he wants us to remember that you can't go without eating. That's what he's trying to show you. He's just saying, as, as important as it is, your next meal, you got to have God's next word for your life. And there is no strength or sustaining without it. It's basically, it's basically this. Some of us are suffering from spiritual anorexia. Some of us are suffering from spiritual anorexia. We're malnourished spiritually. If we could look at ourselves in the mirror spiritually, would you see someone who's fit and fed and satisfied? Or would you see someone who, who's anemic and, 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 and skin and bones? It, it, some of us are on the wrong type of spiritual fast. We only eat once a week and it's on Sundays when we go to church. That's the wrong type of spiritual fast for your life. And here's what you need to know. You can't be who God wants you to be without that daily dose of his word, without eating that meal every day. Your, your strength and your satisfaction, I mean, just all of it will fade. There was a story that I found so compelling. Wayne Gruber, who, who was a, he's actually a person who helps translate the Bible. He was helping to translate the, the ESV version of the Bible. And he was spending eight hours a day with his team translating the Bible from the original manuscripts into this version of the Bible. He, he was so intent in the Bible, these eight hours researching it and studying it, that he thought to himself, there's really no point for me to continue to get up in the mornings and read the Bible because I'm spending so much time in the Bible. So he gave up his, his appointment with God and just said, I'm already in the Bible. Three days later, his wife comes to him and says, Wayne, there's something very wrong with you. I, can't, I, I don't know what it is, but something's wrong. You, you just... I just see you care about things that you shouldn't be caring about, and you're, you're, you're shorter, and, and it just, you know, there's, there's some things, Wayne, what is it? And he said, for the life of me, I didn't know. I thought about it, thought about it, and he said, and then it hit me. It had been three days since I had spent time with God in his word. Here's what I want to tell you, that, and this is just true, I can do all the sermon research in the world, I can do all the church work in the world and prep for these messages, but if I miss time with God, it shows. If I, if I miss one day, I notice. If I miss two days, Kayla notices. And if I miss three days, everybody notices. Proximity to the Bible does not mean that the Bible is active in our lives. And, and so we have to realize that this is extremely important. How important? One last scripture. Matthew 6, 11. Jesus is saying, this is the Lord's Prayer. Many of you probably quoted it. Give us today our daily bread. Now, when we read this, it's mostly about provision, right? I mean, it's like, God, you're, you're going to give me what I need to survive in life, and that's true. But what if this is also about God's Word? That every day, what if Jesus is saying every day God's got a word for you? Every day God's got something He wants to say to you through His Word. Let me ask you this way. What was God's word for you today? 
Now, let me say, if you don't know what that is, then that means you're living today without what God wanted to tell you about today. It means there are things you're going to face, things you're going to encounter, things you don't even know are coming down the pike. Opportunities and also threats that you have no clue about that God wanted to tell you about today. How important is it for us to to make the one resolution and make the Bible a part of our lives daily? It is equally important It is just what feeds our soul. It's it's so important. It is the very nourishment of our soul. So here's what I want to do. I'm going to pray today for you the same prayer that I've prayed every week over this. I'm just going to pray a hunger for God's Word. That something supernaturally ignites in you. That you can take what we talked about today and practically apply it to your life. For blessed are those who actually do this. So just bow your heads in this moment. Let me pray over you. Father... As the pastor, I pray in the name of Jesus that every person here would have a supernatural hunger for your word. I pray, Lord, again, just for those who are, have skeptic, skepticism, God, you're okay with that. Your word stands alone. I pray that you'd lead them to truth. I pray people who struggle with routine and discipline, that the supernatural spirit, the spiritual fruit of self-control raise up in their lives. Father, I pray today for people to hunger for your word like no other time before in their lives. I pray that daily they would eat of this and they would be nourished, full, and at full strength for your glory to be revealed in their life. Lord Jesus, I pray that it would heal marriages, break addictions, transform minds, restore joy, rebuke depression. Lord Jesus, let your word be the healing force that comes forth in this body. Father, give us a hunger for your word. Let us live by it. Let us be sustained by it. Let us be strengthened by it. Understand it. Memorize it. And live by it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. I want you to stand to your feet. As you know, we've started this one-year reading plan. If you've not gotten on board, you can go to Connect Central today, and you can get a one-year reading plan. And and you can start with us. They'll give you all the information you need. If you need a Bible today, you'd say, I I don't have a Bible. We're going to take care of that. Go to Connect Central today. But but let me say this. There's also still room for you to get in a life group, which is one of those things that can help you really apply God's Word. Now, here's the last thing I'll say to you. Pastor Drew's going to sing and dismiss us. Be here next Sunday. It's going to be a game changer. It's not going to be one you're going to want to miss. It's going to be a big, big difference in what God's doing in this community through this church. Be here next Sunday. I love you, and I can't wait to see you first Wednesday this week. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that this message was an encouragement to you to live a life fully devoted to God. For more information about Twin Rivers Worship Center, or if you would like to partner with this church's ministry in St. Louis, Missouri, and around the world by giving, visit us at our website at trwc.com. We would love for you to join us in a worship service at one of our two locations sometime. Have a great day and be blessed.